Today, Bitcoin drops back below the $27,000 level to end the week. A new U.S. bill would require crypto companies to report off-chain transactions to the CFTC. And ahead of Sam Bankman-Fried's trial, Chainlink's Sergei Nazarov weighs in on what could prevent a similar failure in crypto. Welcome to CNBC's Crypto World. I'm Pippa Stevens. Crypto prices are mixed to end the week. As of noon Eastern, Bitcoin fell back below the $27,000 level. Ether inched closer to the $1,700 mark. And Solana added nearly 4%. For the week, Bitcoin's up a little more than 1% on pace for the fourth straight positive week for the first time since February 3rd. Ether is up nearly 5% for the week on pace for its best week since June 23rd when Ether gained more than 10.5%. Okay, let's talk about the top stories. First up, Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong says it's not right for private companies to de-platform the digital asset industry. Speaking on CNBC's Squawk Box yesterday, Armstrong slammed JP Morgan's ban on crypto payments in the UK and stressed that the government should decide what is allowed and what's not allowed. Earlier this week, we told you that Chase's UK branch will stop letting customers buy crypto. According to an email sent to customers and reviewed by CNBC, the banking giant will decline crypto transactions starting October 16th. The bank said the rise in fraud and scams is behind that decision. Other British lenders have taken similar steps to ban crypto transactions, citing the risk of fraud. Those include NatWest, which placed limits on the amount of cash that can be sent to crypto exchanges, and HSBC, which banned crypto purchases altogether. Last, a new U.S. bill aims to require crypto companies to report all blockchain transactions to the CFTC. Yesterday, Congressman Don Beyer introduced the Off-Chain Digital Commodity Transaction Reporting Act, which aims to add consumer protections for digital asset markets. It would require trading platforms to report all transactions to a repository that's registered with the CFTC. The new legislation would protect crypto investors from disputes, manipulation or fraud potentially stemming from transactions occurring off-chain that are not recorded on the publicly viewable blockchain. In a statement, Bayer said the bill is a, quote, common sense measure to restore some transparency and confidence to the digital asset market. He added that as consumers increasingly turn to large digital asset trading platforms to conduct their business, thousands of transactions each day are conducted off the publicly verifiable blockchain. Unfortunately, internal record keeping among these private entities can vary, and this can leave investors and consumers vulnerable to fraud and manipulation. All right, for our main story, the collapse of FTX is a front and center once again, with the trial of the crypto exchange's founder expected to begin on Monday. So Crypto World's Talia Kaplan spoke with Sergey Nazarov, the co-founder of Chainlink, about what could help prevent a similar situation from happening again. The collapse of FTX is in focus again right now ahead of the trial of Sam Bankman-Fried. What do you think was the main takeaway from that massive failure? How has it impacted the industry and what's needed to prevent future events like that from happening again in the crypto space? So I think the thing people should understand about FTX is it's not actually a crypto um, or blockchain related issue or collapse. Uh, FTX was more of a traditional financial uh, entity or institution that was just dealing in crypto assets. So there really wasn't any aspect of how their systems were built or any guarantees from blockchains or private keys that uh, should make people think that it's somehow a failure of blockchain technology. It's really the failure of an institution or an entity that mismanaged some of its assets. So it's, it's not really a failure of blockchain technology. It's just another failure in the long series of failures like Silicon Valley Bank, Enron, and, and, and others, right? The, the thing that I think um, the crypto industry has learned is that even if you have a centralized financial institution dealing in crypto assets, you still need proof about the solvency and reliability of that institution. And what that's led to is the adoption of something called proof of reserves. So we're the largest provider of proof of reserves. We launched it over three years ago. And what it does is it proves the balance sheet 
of the underlying entity or stable coin or gold coin or really any asset. And so what happened after FTX was everyone quickly scrambled to prove to their users that their balance sheet was solid and that their institution was solvent. And proof of reserves played a very important role in that because instead of relying on somebody's word or relying on an auditor to tell you something, you're getting information every second. And that information every second is validated and proven. And it's cryptographically proven to create um, what we call kind of a verifiable web. And so this uh, kind of adoption of proof of reserves and this better proof of the solvency of various institutions and stable coins is, I think, what's come out of the FTX uh, issue so far. What would you tell those people who are skeptical of proof of reserves in terms of painting the full picture as it pertains to crypto firms? I think they should be skeptical. Uh, I think we should all be skeptical. And I think we should all become educated consumers about how everything works. And you're right that proof of reserves can only give you a snapshot of a certain portion of the existence of an entity and its solvency. But actually, there are other proof of things, proof of liabilities, proof of solvency. Really, proof of reserves is just the beginning in a long line of things that go under the heading proof of everything we would like to know to properly manage our risk. So I see um, a lot of other proof of things coming out and becoming widely adopted because uh, proof of reserves does show one piece, but that piece of what the balance sheet is and what the assets are uh, often is the piece that fails most. It's the piece that people hide. It's the piece that people find out and are surprised by. So I think it's definitely a big improvement from an annual audit where some auditor checks something and no one really knows what they checked or what it looked like or what actually happened. But I think you're right that there's space for much more proof of things that prove many other things. Last year was the biggest year for crypto hacks, according to Chainalysis. However, the blockchain analysis firm's mid-year report revealed that crypto crime was down 65% compared to the same time last year, and that revenues from scams and hacks were the most impacted. That being said, we're still hearing about several hacks in the space. Just this week, the Hong Kong-based crypto company Mixin announced it was breached with hackers stealing around $200 million. What do you think is needed to prevent this sort of thing from continuing to happen in crypto? Well, I, I think the numbers are down because the industry isn't growing as much as it was before. And I, I, I think that the thing that's needed for these things to be stopped is for people to stop using decentralization as a buzzword to acquire users and capital. Um, so in the case of, of Mixin, you have a situation where you have a single server in a cloud uh, provider that apparently was breached and led to the loss of funds. If you have decentralization, the breach of a single server that leads to loss of funds isn't something that should be really possible, right? So at, at the end of the day, um, I think that the thing that we need to do is become more educated as consumers. We need to understand the levels of decentralization and the actual security provided by these various systems. And that security uh, needs to be provided with real decentralization where you have multiple different levels of nodes and networks and technologies, that's actually what we specialize in. And we have five different levels of uh, security that we view decentralization providing. And we categorize many of the things that get hacked at, as being at level one or two. So at the very lowest level where they basically claim to have decentralization, but they actually don't. So what do you think is preventing mass adoption of crypto? Is it the erosion of trust that has transpired following the collapse of FTX? Is it all the hacks that we've been seeing or the lack of regulatory clarity here in the US or perhaps a mixture of all three? What do you think? I think it's a mixture of all three. Uh, the crypto industry is a very cyclical industry that's driven by more people getting into it and wanting to participate in larger and larger numbers, which generally increases the amount of assets, the value of the assets, the amount of users interacting with the assets. Things like failures that lead people not to join the industry, various roadblocks um, of a legal nature, and, and other, other issues like security issues generally stop the flow of people from seeing it as a reliable place to put value. So generally speaking, I would say that the cyclical nature of it suggests and, and I've been in every cycle, right? I've been in the crypto industry since 2010. So it's definitely extremely cyclical. 
the, the important thing is that when the nice next cycle happens and when the next influx of value happens, that the systems and entities and institutions and smart contracts can handle that much value. Because the story is basically always the same. There's a big boom in interest. There's a big boom in demand. There's more assets. There's more usage. And then um, that boom reaches a kind of fever pitch or a point where value is lost or value is mismanaged. Um, and that loss and mismanagement basically stops or, you know, yeah, basically stops that, that part of the cycle and begins the downward part of the cycle. So I think what's very important is that as people build infrastructure and systems in this industry, those infrastructure and systems are built in a way that they can handle these greater amounts of value that are going to come in the next cyclical boom, which I think is what everybody expects to happen in, in, the, in the crypto industry. And in most cases, I think even outside the crypto industry. Nazarov also previews Chainlink's Web3 conference called SmartCon, which kicks off next week in Barcelona. You can check out his full interview on cnbc.com slash crypto world. That's all for this week, but we are back again on Monday and we'll see you then.